Hi everyone, this is Tom, and this is Tiznar for Madeline. It's a female dwarf, winner of Dwarf Week. Uh, the first time that, uh, uh, that, that uh, there's been a female dwarf, so that's pretty cool. They don't really come up that often, um, at least not in fantasy in general. They, I mean, they obviously exist, but uh, uh, even in uh, Middle Earth, there's only one that was ever named. Her name was Dis. She was the mother of Feely and Keely, the uh, the sister of Thor and Oakenshield. Um, but that, uh, that gets pretty, uh, esoteric, and I could go about that. Uh, <laughs> don't get me started on, on Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings, but either way, um, it was a fun challenge, uh, brought up some different sort of questions and things, and, and I had to make some dis decisions as I went, and I can, I, I'll go over that as we get into the, uh, into the video, and I'll, I'll talk about stuff. Mostly it's like, uh, finding that balance between, um, biological feasibility, uh, accuracy to the lore, and also just general aesthetics and personality, and uh, what a viewer can expect and how to how to try to find a balance between that. In the case of uh, Tiznar, because of her description and how sort of she's she's quite plucky, um, I, I sort of with the face, it's like typically if it was like if I was building a world, uh, dwarves would all be kind of ugly, even the females. Um, but in, if you're, if you're making something that's more like D and D, which is a product, there needs to be a bit more appeal and there can be appeal in having like a, uh, a hard line stance on dwarves and things and treating them that way. But when they're sort of described the way this way, you know, it, it makes sense that she's going to be pretty, a, a human living in, uh, in, in the, the real world is going to, it'll be, it just makes things a lot easier and better if they're a bit prettier. <clears throat> and more normal things like uh um like the structure of the face uh the size of the nose especially the bridge of the nose those are things where if you push them too far on a female they it does start blurring that line between uh, it, it's much much it's much easier to to turn a female into something grotesque than a male but in the way that they shouldn't be it's sort of tough to explain but uh there definitely is a lot more um terrain you can take a male face and have it still retain the sort of character that you're after it's pretty tough especially if, if you're just trying to make someone that's still um actually it's not even that true like if you're if i was trying to make like a kind of like a, an attractive um male dwarf i wouldn't push it that far even in uh, peter jackson's uh hobbit movies uh there's, like, I actually have, they come up again, Feely and Keely, the way that they they cast those, they were supposed to be kind of the younger, um, charming ones, and they had almost, I think, no appliances on their face, no, like, fake, I don't, they had fake ears, and maybe a little bit on the nose, but, but even there you can see, if, if characters are supposed to be more, um, relatable, approachable, desirable, uh, you can't take them that far, male or female. So anyway, let me go into the description. And this might make a bit more sense of what's going on here. Um, so, blah, blah, blah. My dwarf is a female mountain dwarf named Tiznar. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And she's 25, so she's still fairly young in dwarven years. She weighs around 150 pounds. She's very pale due to living below ground for a long period of time, but has, um, uh, has a more red splotchy complexion on her cheeks and nose with a splatter of freckles on her cheeks. Her hair is a dark brown, which she keeps in milkmaid-style braids wrapped around the crown of her head with two small clumps that she keeps in her face as a stylistic choice, much to her mum's disapproval. She's about four foot nine, but is extremely muscular due to her working as a blacksmith. She has a smaller chest and is more bottom-heavy than top, but had strong arms due to lifting large axes and armor pieces in her home in the mountain. Her history is that she was raised as a blacksmith's youngest daughter, charged with fit fitting armor to the other dwarves and any adventuring folks that came to the mountain. She eventually got bored of being the lowest dwarf on that chain, but with her parents refusing to let her move up, she decided to borrow a small plate, breastplate and strike out on her own path so that, she, so that when she returned, she would be respected and worldly enough to take over her family's craft. She also just kind of wanted to bash some people around a bit. <clears throat> Her stats are 23 Strength, 20 Dexterity, 17 Constitution, 10 Intelligence, 13 Wisdom, and 20 Charisma. She's gifted in Athletics, Acrobatics, and Intimidation, but is crap at Religion and History. Her personality is rather kind and gentle, despite swinging around a Warhammer. She talks to her hammer a lot and keeps smith tools on her at all times in a leather pouch on her waist. She, uh, her hands tend to be pretty grimy, and she has sooty fingers quite often. 
She's very much uh, a rush-in type of fighter, so she's constantly very loud, and she's not used to being around non-dwarves. She's a fighter with her main weapon being an iron warhammer that she lovingly named Susie. It's a uh, its hammer end is very simple rectangle with dwarven details, but the hilt is personalized by her with straps uh, <clears throat> of leather and textured cloth in a dark blue color palette that she's wrapped around the end to keep her grip and also to make sure she doesn't lose it. Her outfit consists of a dark navy blue tabard with lighter blue mountains embroidered on the bottom, underneath being uh, underneath being a simple black top. She wears black pants that are bigger near the knees because they're too big for her, and she has dark gray leather boots that she tucks them into. She wears a simple plate curious over her, her curious, a queer ass. I, I've seen the world a million times. I don't know how to, it's specifically pronounced, or even if I think that's actually spelled correctly, cure, cure ass, uh, the breastplate. <laughs> it's like the torso chunk of armor, uh, that she borrowed after some bandits tried to jump her and her companions. Her clothes are embroidered with lots of little trims and tassels as her party members love to make sure she looks fashionable despite little filling, despite the ill-fitting nature of some of her clothes. Uh, and that's that's the description. <clears throat> and I look back at my video and uh, it's basically mostly been drawn. Um, there were a couple things that I had to ask for clarification on. One of it was the, uh, the hairstyle. I just wasn't sure about the two clumps, but Madeline was able to send me a picture of exactly what she means. So it's basically like these two long strands of braids coming down. Um, but as far as uh, taking that description, um, you hear about how much personality she has, how plucky she is, how she's got a, like her weapon she talks to, and she's, she's cute and sweet. Um, so in there you can sort of see why uh, her face would fall under the category of um, uh, humanized uh, appeal. Uh, I think it's a suitable place for that. Um, and then as far as the uh, the costume itself, it really was more of a one-to-one -one, uh, put in things as they're described. Uh, and that, uh, that that's actually pretty nice. Sometimes I feel like I get like a, like a like an itch where I want to be super artsy and I want to feel like I'm inspired and I want to do something where there's symbolism and stuff. But other times in this case, it's really nice. It's a nice change of pace, uh, when it, it gets to just be putting in the description because there's still lots of room for interpretation and putting my own little twists on things and what have you. But, uh, but it is nice, especially when somebody knows their character really well or that they've had them long enough that the description is there. They have an idea of like what they wear, how they wear it, uh, where they got the clothing from, and, and what sort of role they play, and how that affects their their outfit and thing. But uh, it really just help, helps make things go uh, go smoothly. It was although I mean even though it did kind of help it go a bit more smoothly, it was still it actually was still sort of challenging. I mean there there's been a lot of things that popped up in the last few days that made it difficult to to find the time to put the work on here, like chores and repairing things around the house. But, um, as far as like just sort of moving simply with it, uh, there was that challenge where it's like, it's straightforward. Um, her role and station are fairly, uh, um, not standard, but you know, they're very like fundamental, uh, fantasy fiction story um, sort of role for this type of character and their outfit is just very well it's this and it's that and it's simple and plain and straightforward and you, you kind of just get it right away but um, in a lot of the times like in a lot of ways like even in real life people just wear clothes uh, and they don't seem to say much even though uh, there's a lot to be said about even when things are mundane, what that does say, things always say something. There's always like some re there's always something behind it that you, or something that you can get out of it. But um, what am I trying to say here? Where it's just uh, it because she's so um, uh, dwarven and blacksmithy. You know, you got a dwarf, you got a, a blacksmith, you've got a plucky girl who's a bit like rebellious and wants to do some sort of trade work or what have you and she's fighting and everything it's it's there's it's very you get it right away so there's it's it, if you start adding too much 
personality and too much zaniness or uniqueness, then that can actually distract from what people already kind of know what she is. Like you can you can get a good sense of her like right away, really easily. And and if you start, try to make try to find ways to make her t like extremely unique or or what have you, it actually pulls away from that. So it was a bit of a fight to try to just kind of keep things a bit more down to earth but still the trick is like it's easy to do things down to earth but you need to still keep them interesting and that that's a whole that's an that's a challenge in and of itself now i'm also quite uh out of practice um and so <laughs> i've had to actually go back and watch a couple of my old videos and click through things and and remember sort of different processes and stuff like i i've actually been only able to do very little art recently in the last oh nine months very 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 little most of the stuff at work i've been doing has been more graphic design related um and even at home my evenings are um i get home from work and then i i play with the baby and take care of him and help him and feed him and put him to bed and there's only about like an hour or two after he's to bed where i'd been able to uh to get any work done now it's more like about three hours like I, I put him to bed at eight uh and then uh and then i come down and spend time doing r&d fantasy stuff but i mean this week of course being all the all this weird housework stuff you move into a, a you, you, you once after you move and you gotta like make sure everything's kind of working right and you gotta plug some leaks and things but um but no it's been good and but but through that process I've, i have sort of like forgotten i have forgotten some of the stuff because a lot of the things as i was going through rnd fantasy was um rote approaches standard stuff that i would usually do but by trying out different systems and techniques and approaches i had actually been learning quite a bit and, and stuff and had been but i just hadn't had it and i did a lot of things differently each time so i didn't have that much time to uh try out certain techniques over multiple characters so that but but actually uh there's been times where advice that I'd been that I'd given in other videos I was I, I was reminded by advice that I had given and it actually helped me out <laughs> with making new stuff where it's thing the biggest one was like uh is is as basic as it sounds just like don't give up like if if something's not working out if you're having a hard time doing some folds in some fabric or a hand or whatever don't give up on it and if you need to, just work on something else and come back to it later. It's going to look wrong an hour from now. It's going to look wrong a day from now. Uh, just work on stuff and get more of the picture done. And, you know, build up your strength, build up your palette. Uh, do it that way. And things like that. Like, uh, it's, like even sometimes if I say stuff, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, that sounds nice. But, I mean, it, yeah, it probably works. But but it is good to know that um, that my advice even helps me so if you're if you're if you're skeptical you know even i am sometimes and it's nice to know that it, that, that that stuff works so it's it's been a nice challenge to even get all the rest out of my joints i can't even tell you how like much in a rut i've been and that happens to me once once or twice a year where you'll just draw and draw and draw you'll doodle 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 and everything just turns to mush in your hands it just every doodle sucks if you guys could see like i have a little notepad beside my desk at work and if i'm like waiting for a big file to save or getting the file system updated or whatever i'll just do some doodles of like most most of the time i'm drawing like just figures and muscular systems and anatomy things and for the last month and a half it's just been absolute just trash garbage like i forgot how to draw it all and then uh and then recently um i've been working on a piece at work that is actually turning out to be maybe the my favorite thing i've ever drawn and it's been giving me a lot of fun and and the context is different um the genre is not what i'm used to and uh and it, it it's uh i think by dedicating myself to one thing and also doing a lot of stuff on it it kind of makes everything a little bit less sacrosanct like everything can be taken a little with a little bit less uh specific specificity and nuance and so it kind of gives everything a bit less pressure and less less uh less weight and that is a 
it's almost like a confidence booster or just like a, a, a sort of competence. I don't know. There's just so much more going on where like if, if you have a drawing that's only three lines, each one of those lines has to be perfect. But if you have a drawing that's 300 lines, there's not that pressure because every line can, I mean, or at least it's not a game changer if one line isn't right on because you're, you're going to be the only one that notices it. Uh, but yeah, being stuck in a rut, the, 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 the thing that it's just been really helping is just keep, keep drawing anyway. Um, if I was to, the next time I get into a rut, which will probably be in you know, probably about like 12 minutes from now, uh, I'm going to, the thing that I'm going to do is swap out the medium. So if I'm drawing in ink, I'm going to draw in pencil. If I'm drawing in digital, I'm going to draw in ink, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm going to draw something in a different genre. And I'm going to draw something that might be, uh, uh, actually different genre is enough. So if you're drawing a lot of like fantasy stuff, draw some sci-fi stuff. If you're drawing some sci-fi stuff, draw some Western stuff. If you're drawing Western stuff, draw some fantasy stuff or, or whatever, you know, just mix up the genre, draw some, draw stuff that you're not really familiar with. I think a big part of the, the rut process is, uh, for me, I noticed that it was, I'm not thinking about what I'm drawing. I'm thinking about how I'm drawing it. Like, okay, now I draw this line. Now I draw this shape. And it, that, that's, it sort of, uh, takes the air out of it and just derails me. And that sort of get, gets my brain shifted. But if I'm just trying to communicate a form and just like, doing it intuitively as I go, that can help a lot. And that, that's, uh, that's hard to explain, uh, that sort of stuff. So if, if you ever try that out, if you think you got a grasp on what I'm trying to describe and, and you try it out, let me know if it worked. Let me know if it helped at all. Cause I think, uh, I'm pretty sure every artist, or at least most of us, uh, suffered from this problem. And when you say stuck in a rut, I think people know it, what you mean and everybody struggles with it, and people have uh, all sorts of solutions and things that works for them. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, try out different stuff, see what see what else works. But those things have been really helpful for me. So with working on her clothing, you, I mean, you, you've got things as described, like the pants that are baggy around the knees because they're all tucked in and they're too big, and then this big coat um, that I believe was mentioned that she got from some bandits. So it's a bit too big for her, so the, the sleeves are rolled up. Uh, backwards up over her arms and it's just a big billowy sloppy thing with the, the, tr the problem with um with this sometimes is if you've got anatomy so she has a pretty interesting body it's dwarven frame dwarven skeleton so already it's sort of neat and she's got a pear-shaped figure so she has like sort of wide hips big butt thick thighs and then smaller breasts so she's like very like bottom heavy and, but she's also very muscular up top like very oh yeah there's another thing here where i noticed that she just wasn't coming out as um young enough or merry enough so I enlarged her eyeballs and that that's all it took <laughs> before I was like okay yeah that, that's what it was the big doe eyes sort of like a like bell from Sleeping Beauty or so or um Beauty and the Beast or something you know just, just sort of it, it always works it helps a lot um but yeah so she's got this interesting figure that would be fun to draw uh but then of course she's got a tabard which is thick fabric she's got underneath that she's got a shirt who knows what else she might have underneath that like some sort of undergarment and then she's got this big this big leather jacket that's not only big but it's also too big and then you and it's billowy and on all this stuff is just covering covering and gone and, and and so all that figure is is lost to uh lost to time and it's all under there but uh i guess it's i mean it is still there, and you know the figure affects the the outer thing. But it it'd be nice to have uh, just some more time with with that sort of a figure. It doesn't come up very often. I mean, here I'm trying out different pet places where embroidery could go, and I eventually drop all of this because it just I knew the jacket wasn't ready yet. It didn't feel designed enough. As for these boots. Um, simple a simple black leather working boot but i've also given her uh to make them seem a bit more blacksmithy and this is a bit cheating because it's not technically blacksmithy but it needed to look like more of a tradesman uh, blue collar boot uh but it's based on welder's boots they have uh they'll, you know they'll usually be steel toe of course but there's also a flap that goes back up over the uh 
over the laces. I don't know exactly what it's for, but I assume that it's for uh, stopping sparks from setting your, uh, or like melting your shoelaces or catching them on fire and you're getting sparks and hot hot bits of stuff into your into your boot and also to deflect any sort of bars and rods that might be up that's i mean it just seems like basic uh obvious footwear um but i think adding that little tongue it's like an extra like shoe tongue but on the side or on the outside i thought that would you know help give for boots even though they're simple they're one color just a little bit more context and setting and history and then underneath the uh I also didn't want to, uh, oh, excuse me, the awning is back. Uh, I didn't want to, uh, give her just the standard sole, uh, on, on the, on the boots, because it just, it's just too easy, uh, and to, for me to want to do that naturally, so I had the, it's sort of like a boot where the, the leather just ends down at the bottom, and then there's something going on underneath, uh, sort of like a, it, it's like its own sort of leather skirting, I imagine that would keep stuff from damaging too easily and then spikes on the bottom for for extra grip and then uh madeline mentioned having a mountain embroidered on the bottom of the tabard and uh i figured okay <clears throat> i don't want to uh, shake the ship um like until i would develop my whole a whole world with a whole civilization of dwarves i don't want to shake the ship when it comes to uh the whole geometric dwarven patterns people get that it's a really good quick uh, shorthand for dwarven cultural motifs um and with the mountain i wanted it to be an abstract pattern that was like a mountain uh and it uh and uh i was looking for a setting and i couldn't find it i'll have to look it up later uh, but yeah, just a just a motif, more of like a pattern rather than a, an image. It's definitely just like a, a fabric design, a pattern. I didn't want something that was symmetrical because I think that if dwarves are building stuff that's symmetrical, um, that would be too easy. I think if I mean geometric patterns with metal and stone is the easiest stuff to do with metal and stone, but I think that uh, doing stuff that's deliberately asymmetrical so that a dwarf couldn't just flip a pattern and use it but they would have to like balance things the other way and you know even though it's simple and, and uh, angular it would i don't know i think it would be a good way to show um some some more mastery some more care but also oh excuse me i also just think it would be just more interesting this way as well um there's just some some place for some more flair. I haven't seen anything like that. So it's the uh, the mountain is basically uh, you have the the stone is represented by the gray and the shadow on the different contours of the of the mountain is represented by the negative space where you can see the rest of the blue tabard behind. And then in a little bit, not yet now, I'll put in some stitching, some lighter stitching, and that sort of there to help lighten it, almost like you know the snow is there it's a little bit brighter it's the white and and the gray on the mountain i was just down in my hometown a couple of weeks ago uh in calgary and i could see the mountains and it was uh the summertime so all the snow was gone and i haven't i don't get to see the mountains very much anymore and it was just sort of funny seeing them without snow they just look totally totally different uh but yeah, yeah, I just had mountains in, on my mind. So it's just when I was thinking of mountains, I was thinking gray. Normally, I think of them as as white, just covered in snow. Uh, but yeah, it's sort of funny thinking that that stuff. As far as the um, uh, the uh, the the blacksmithing supplies, um, it's it's sort of just sort of. It's, kind of tucked away out to the side uh, I figured she'd be right-handed you know chances are so it's on that side they just happen to be tucked over on that side and then um, but I was watching a a video I don't remember what it was there I had it it was there was some sort of traveling um, I think it was a nail maker or something I saw it was like a historical thing and it was a medieval traveling nail maker 
box and it was like a little workstation that he had and there was a hammer but the person presenting it made sure that they mentioned how the head of the hammer was angled downwards so that it was more like ergonomic he didn't have to raise his hand so high or you know the motions could be smaller it could be more accurate and less chance of injury and so I, I put a little bit of a downward um, angle on the end of the hammer there that was inspired by that sometimes things just you notice something leading up to a drawing or, or during the time when you're working on a drawing and you can just sort of throw it in little details like that and then on the uh, the tongs up above I imagine them having a sort of a compact travel tongue and so the, uh, the those weird little the lumps on the end with the prongs up top those would be like where you could flip around an extra little bit of um, handle or limb or what have you uh, just so that they could be more compact when when putting away now as far as the uh, the hammerhead coming along um, I've been watching a lot of uh, woodcraft and tool making videos and I always like when they make an axe and they have that little or they do it on like anything like dressers and things where you have like the uh, kind of like the dovetail or the the tenon and they put the slot down in it they put it through where it's got to go and then they hammer a wedge down into it so that it uses like a friction grip that expands into the space and uh, I always love when they do that and so even over here I wanted to have that down the side where you can see that kind of that spike it might even be a wedge that goes down through the top of the hammer um, now on here I've also noticed a lot where they actually with axes and things they'll forge it where it's a um, I don't know which one is I think the yeah the the very tip of the axe in this case it's a hammer I, th I don't know if they do it with hammers but it's a higher carbon metal steel that they put into the front and then with the rest of the axe they it's a it's a softer um, more iron heavy uh, material and then they close it around the edge of this little this um, ingot of, of harder steel so that the edge keeps a, a tip better it's a harder metal it's more brittle but it keep, it retains its edge better it's less soft um, then I thought it'd be neat to have that indicated with I mean you can see it with the different color of the metal but then on this one with that weird um, spiraling that pattern underneath I picture that actually being like the underside of a cross section where even though it's a simple hammer you can see where through dwarven mastery of metal they've actually folded this metal into the other metal in some highly uh, intense way where I can't even fathom where they've like it normally it's just it's just like a sandwich in real life you've got two pieces on the outside and one in the middle and they just hammer it together and you know sharpen it but in this one I think it'd be neat to have it like they're just so entwined that it's just ridiculous and so it's a little bit it's a little way to have a really sim a simple subtle uh, uh, nod to excessive uh, dwarven mastery of things so we got grimy hands and now we've got tassels and things sort of all billowing out I picture this uh, having a lot of fun movement if she were to be walking uh, so these tassels reach around those larger leather panels that go up the arms and and all the way around So that's uh that's Tisnar for Madeline. Thanks for watching everybody. I hope this was uh, informative or useful and if you have any questions or comments, let me know. I try to answer every single one. Uh and I think I do. I don't know if they've ever uh, really messed up. So this is for the free character art lottery. If you want to know more about that, show up on Twitter at RND Fantasy and uh it'll be up to date, kept up to date, update. I'll usually post new art on the weekends and the lotteries are held uh, at, at this current schedule every Monday uh, but it starts it goes from Sunday night to the end of Monday so you'll have all of Monday um, to enter in so it's free character art lottery uh, for fantasy RPG characters of your own creation um, yeah just let me know if you have any questions let me know if that helps 
Uh, and I hope you had a good time watching it. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.